Sony recently announced a three-tiered update to PlayStation Plus, but its inconsistent and odd pricing has sent players searching for legacy subscription cards. Good morning, good Tuesday morning to you. I'm Shane Satterfield from Sifted, and this is Good Morning Gaming for April 5th, 2022. The show is in our patrons' feeds bright and early every weekday morning, and free on our YouTube channel for everyone else. You want to get in on that patron action, though. You can find our flagship show, Game Face, by searching your favorite podcast service, You'll find the podcast versions of the rest of our content in the same feed you found this. So we've talked about PlayStation's brand new three-tiered PlayStation Plus program that is going to replace the current PlayStation Plus and its game streaming service, PlayStation Now. A month of PlayStation Now currently costs $10, while PlayStation Plus Premium that will replace it costs $18 a month. Players who have an existing PlayStation Now subscription will have it converted into the new PlayStation Premium tier. So conceivably, if you can subscribe to PlayStation Now for less before PlayStation Plus Premium launches, you could end up saving a ton of money. So players are buying up any and all remaining PlayStation Now subscriptions either digitally or via physical cards. If you do manage to buy a full year of PlayStation Now for 60 bucks, it could save you $60 per year on the new plan. Some players have reportedly stacked subscriptions that will last a full decade or more. They should be ready for PS7, or they could completely get burned if the service is ultimately discontinued. Sony wasn't oblivious to this tactic. In fact, it quietly removed the annual PlayStation Now subscription offer from its website a few months ago, back in January, while brick-and-mortar retailers in the UK stopped selling physical cards for PlayStation Now subscriptions quite a while ago. So if it saw this coming, why was it not alert to the strange pricing structure and disparity of the new PlayStation Plus tiers? We're paying month-to-month -month will end up costing you double what you'd pay for a year up front. It's mind-boggling. There's also the question of what will happen to people who currently have annual subscriptions to both PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now. Will those two subscriptions be turned into one premium subscription, essentially wasting months of a subscription you've paid for, or will they stack up more months of premium? No one knows, but the PlayStation Now cards are still out there, so buy them if you can before the new system launches in June. And now for a couple more stories from the top of your SIFs. I'm sure by now, those of you who want to have watched season two of The Witcher on Netflix. Now, I enjoyed it a great deal when it released back at the holidays. I was trapped on the East Coast due to COVID and plane issues and other things. And I ended up watching, well, really binging season two. And I enjoyed it, but I did feel like it wrapped up in an underwhelming fashion. Well, there's good news for people like me because... The Witcher Season 3 is already being filmed. And not only that, today, the plot for Season 3 was revealed. Well, at least a rough outline for it. It appears that the show is moving back towards the plot of the books. Geralt will take Ciri into hiding to protect her. Meanwhile, Yennefer takes Ciri under her wing to maximize her magical powers. But they get mixed up in politics, dark magic, and treachery. So there's your conflict. While the third season is shooting right now, it currently has no release date. Kirby won a Grammy last night. Well, the composers on one of his games did anyway. Arrangers Charles Rosen and Jay Silverman won for Best Arrangement, Instrumental, or Acapella for their big band arrangement of Meta Knight's Revenge from Kirby Superstar. Oddly enough, this award was not given away on stage during the broadcast. Shocker. How awesome would it be if someone opened an envelope and read Meta Knight's Revenge? <laughs> Unfortunately, that didn't happen, but it is only the second ever video game winner at the Grammy Awards. It was performed by the 8-Bit Big Band featuring Button Masher, and it's a brilliant jazz arrangement of the game's title track. I know we've talked about this twice already, but we're going to talk about it again because today it was announced that Epic Games Fortnite has now raised 
$4 million for Ukraine relief efforts. It is absolutely amazing. That's just two weeks of Epic's revenues for Fortnite microtransactions. That's insane. Now, it did happen at the start of a new season when players are more likely to be spending. But man, there's no denying that it is just a massive total. Kudos to Epic. I really feel like it could make a huge difference for the people who are suffering in Ukraine. In other Ukraine-related news, World of Tanks developer Wargaming will no longer operate in Russia or Belarus. World of Tanks will be managed by a local studio no longer affiliated with Wargaming called Lusta Studio. It has also begun the process of closing its Minx Studio and says it will offer as much severance as possible to the affected employees. The company will not profit from this process and expects to suffer substantial losses as a direct result. Wargaming is taking one for the team, and I've got to say, I don't know that I've ever been more proud of the gaming industry than over these last six weeks, watching the industry rally behind the people of Ukraine. So we mentioned on yesterday's Good Morning Gaming that players of Halo Infinite are getting restless and that a representative from 343 had gone on Reddit and said that it understood why fans and hardcore players were running out of patience. Well, today... Seemingly trying to satiate said angry hardcore fans, 343 detailed the changes and maps and other information coming to Halo Infinite Season 2 when it launches on May 3rd. We're getting two new maps, a couple new modes, and a bunch of quality of life changes. And they're a start, but there's still so much to do. The two new maps in Season 2, one is for Arena, and it's called Catalyst, and then one is for Big Team Battle, and it's called Breaker. While there's no information on Catalyst, Breaker features a, quote, gigantic moving laser that cuts across the center of the map and destroys anything that gets caught in its beam, end quote. So, it does seem to be an active map, but it's just one map. If you've spent any time playing Big Team Battle in Halo Infinite, it is maddening how few maps there are to play on. It's so repetitive. You get tired of it after playing like 30 or 40 minutes. And now we're just getting one new map? According to 343, it's also, quote, tighter and faster playing, end quote, than the other big team battle maps currently in Infinite. Okay. As for the modes, King of the Hill and Attrition are returning to multiple playlists, and the revive process is being revamped. There's also... A bevy of quality of life improvements on the way, but two maps and two and a half modes isn't much when players will have waited over five months for season two. And perhaps the biggest missing announcement still is that cooperative play for the campaign still isn't in the schedule. 343, what gives? The Sonic the Hedgehog movie part two opened to 25.5 million within international theaters over the weekend. That's actually 2% more revenue than the film from 2020, which also launched first in international markets. The original film went on to make 210 million within its first 10 days globally, which means the sequel is in line, if data holds true, to do even better. It launches in the US this Friday, April 8th. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll tackle today's boss fight. sequel to a beloved franchise from the past was announced. But it also brings to mind how many dead franchises fans are begging for that may lack relevance in the current gaming landscape. Now that Lucas is back in direct control of its video game back catalog, it appears we have a very pleasant surprise. Return to Monkey Island was announced today. And not only that, Ron Gilbert is heading up the project and handling a lot of the writing. Some of the franchise's famous composers are also returning, it will also include a brand new story that picks up where Monkey Island 2, LeChuck's Revenge, left off. There's no word on platforms yet, but it is scheduled for release this year, which is crazy. This is all great news, but it took Gilbert 
offering to buy the IP from Lucas in a fan petition to get it made. And all this got me thinking. There are so many other video game franchises that I feel need to be revived, but will they make an impact in 2022? Now, if you remember, I've talked about gaming franchises that need to be revived in Good Morning Gaming before. I've called them video game zombies, franchises that died and need to be revived, just like a zombie. In the case of Monkey Island, it's predominantly an interactive story with some puzzles mixed in. That formula is always going to work, even if the vast majority of current game players have no idea what Monkey Island is. That genre in particular hasn't evolved all that much over time, save for branching story paths based on your choices. So I'm pretty confident that Return to Monkey Island is going to do pretty well, and it is a franchise that a lot of fans have been asking for for a really long time. But there are so many others that fans have asked for that ended up being terrible ideas. For example, Battletoads. People wanted a new Battletoads for years and years. One is finally announced. It turns out it's just another 2D beat-em-up. It comes and goes with nary a wave made. Then there's Leisure Suit Larry. I don't know that a lot of people really requested for that franchise to come back, but it did. And culturally, it just really no longer fits in 2022. The franchise is a ribald take on a middle-aged man who is sexually repressed. And it just has lots of very low-hanging fruit jokes, a lot of sexual innuendo. It's like watching one of those movies from the 80s and you just sit there and kind of cringe the whole time. That's Leisure Suit Larry in 2022. Then there was probably the most requested revival of all time, and that would be Shenmue 3. And Shenmue 3 is one of the worst video games that I have played probably in the last decade. It was terrible. And it was a perfect example of simply making the same game again many, many years later, not working. Another game that comes to mind, Star Fox Zero. People had been asking for a new Star Fox for a really long time. Nintendo didn't have the resources to do it, so it schluffed it off to Bandai Namco. It ended up being this horrible bastardized version of Star Fox where you could run on foot and fire rocket launcher. It just, it completely botched its handling of the Star Fox mythos. So there are some examples of revived franchises that did not work out as people intended, but there are still so many other franchises that fans have been requesting that are just waiting to be revived. And I'm going to share a few of them and share my take on whether I think they could actually work in present day. First up, Road Rash. For whatever reason, people really want another Road Rash. If you don't know what it is, it's basically a motorcycle racing game where you wreck everyone else on the road. You ride up beside them, you kick their bike or whatever, you kick them off the road, they die in a fiery crash. It's a very simple game and a very simple concept. And while I could see it maybe working as a mobile game, a full console version of Road Rash makes absolutely no sense in 2022. It's been gone for so long, it would have to have a massive drastic overhaul before ever considering releasing a new Road Rash. Next up, Carmageddon. Carmageddon was Twisted Metal before Twisted Metal. It was a car combat game where you that basically just survived on the novelty of mowing down zombies with your car. Now, back in the 90s, when games hadn't really evolved, it was, uh, I wouldn't call it good. <laughs> I would say it was interesting for the time because there just weren't other games like that. But over time, car combat has really just kind of taken a nosedive. And not for a lack of trying, there have been some recent games like Destruction All-Stars for PlayStation 5. It's just a genre that hasn't managed to stay relevant. If you think back to the early aughts, there were so many car combat franchises. Even Rockstar had one. But over time, people grew tired of them. There were too many sequels coming too fast, and people just burn out on them. So that genre in general is dead. And in fact, another franchise that people ask for all the time, Twisted Metal, which reportedly is coming back, in fact, to coincide with the Twisted Metal TV show that's in development, I also do not have high hopes for that. So, Carmageddon, Twisted Metal. Eh. Next up, System Shock. System Shock is a franchise that people have actually been trying to revive 
In fact, System Shock 3 was in development for quite a while, and now people believe that it's just been canceled. So, it can be relevant, but to a degree. In fact, we still get a lot of games that are similar to System Shock, which would be the immersive sim, Dishonored, Prey from 2017. Games like that are basically the next evolution of System Shock. So, you can make a game like that in 2022, but if you go back and look at the sales that Bethesda enjoyed or did not enjoy for games like Dishonored, they're okay, but they're not amazing. So to me, bringing back a game like System Shock is very, very risky, and it appears that that is borne out because they tried to revive it, and it seems to have failed. Next up, Jet Set Radio, the Dreamcast classic inline skating game with crazy cel-shaded visuals, awesome graffiti art, a great soundtrack. Is that stuff still relevant today? Everything is except for inline skating, <laughs> which is basically the crux of the franchise. Now, could they revive it and maybe have skateboarding or snowboarding? I think that has a chance to be more successful, but will it ultimately be successful? I highly doubt it. Again, they were Dreamcast games. We're going back 22 years at this point. Next on the extreme sports docket, SSX, probably the greatest snowboarding franchise of all time. I would argue it's the most fun I've ever had playing a snowboarding game. It was arcade style, completely over the top, completely insane. And I still have fun with it. I can still play SSX Tricky and have a good time. So do I think that this franchise could be revived? Yes, for the most part, and snowboarding games haven't really gone away. What's really happened with them is that smaller developers have started tackling that genre with mixed results. Do I think it would sell well enough for a publisher like EA to make it worth its while? That's dicey. It would probably have to lower its expectations a little bit, but SSX is still fun. I think it still has some cachet, so I'll give that a pass. Next up. Turok Dinosaur Hunter, the N64 classic, or at least a franchise that was launched on the Nintendo 64. There have been somewhat modern attempts at this franchise, but they really kind of just lost the plot. They didn't understand what made Turok such a hit back in the day, which was just fighting dinosaurs. That's really what was fun about it. And the most recent Turok was more like a sci-fi shooter where every once in a while you'd bump into dinosaurs. No. You need to send us back to the prehistoric period where the dinosaurs ruled the Earth and ask us to survive, then Turok could work. Next up, Banjo-Kazooie. Another franchise that has been revived, kind of. We got Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, which actually was not a Banjo-Kazooie game at all. It was this weird vehicle-building game that just slapped Banjo and Kazooie on top of it. It was not good even as a vehicle building game. It was definitely not good as a Banjo-Kazooie game. But the bigger question here is, are 3D platformers relevant in 2022? Unless you're talking about Mario, I don't know that they are. A lot of recent 3D platformers have not done especially well. Some guys spun off from Rare and started their own studio. And they launched their own 3D platformer franchise, and it did okay. It was a Kickstarter, and it did well enough to launch it, and there was kind of a 2D spinoff that was really hard. So I guess you could say it's successful. Having a successful 3D platformer in 2022 is not an easy task. Do I think it's possible that Banjo could be revived and be successful? Yes, I'll go with a yes on that one. Next up, Castlevania. Konami Really no interest in creating a new Castlevania game. Certainly not in creating a really expensive 3D Castlevania game. Do I think something like that could be successful? Hell yeah! To me, Elden Ring is basically just Castlevania. In fact, playing Elden Ring this weekend, I got a whip. And the first thing I thought of was, hey, here it is, Castlevania in the modern age. No one's ever going to get sick of fighting and killing Dracula. It's just one of those settings one of those situations, one of those enemies, one of those villains that people are never going to grow tired of. Castlevania, so far, top of my list for franchises that need to be revived. Next up, Sly Cooper. We've been hearing rumors about Sly Cooper being revived, that there's one on the way, that there's a studio working on one right now for PlayStation. Do I think it could work? So what we're talking about with Sly Cooper is a 3D platformer that relies on stealth which 
At that point, you're asking for two genres that have kind of fallen out of favor to be combined together to become a successful product. It hasn't been that long since the last Sly Cooper, and I did recently see sales numbers for the Sly Cooper franchise. They are terrible. In fact, I don't think a single one of them sold more than 3 million copies. I think your answer is right there. Those games were released back when people were more open to the 3D platformer and more open to stealth, to be honest with you, and they weren't interested back then. I don't think they'd be interested now. A lot of people have requested Tenchu, Stealth Assassins, the PlayStation 1 classic. Honestly, one of the best PlayStation 1 games. Now, reportedly, when From Software started working on Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, the game started as Tenchu. And you can see it, because you have kind of the grappling mechanics, you have the rooftop gameplay that you saw in Tenchu. Uh, but ultimately... From Software decided against reviving Tenchu, and they morphed it into Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, and I don't think too many people complained. Again, Tenchu was a stealth-driven game, something that was really cool when 3D games first launched, but over time, people lost interest. I would also point to Splinter Cell as a franchise that gradually lost relevancy due to its reliance on stealth. So, do I think Tenchu deserves to be revived? Probably not. From Software probably did the right thing with transforming it into Sekiro. And then finally, a personal favorite that I've requested for a long time, and probably stupidly so, and that is Dragon's Lair. The classic arcade, lack of interaction, dollar per play, make one mistake and you die adventure game. What I love about Dragon's Lair really are the characters and the art. And there have been attempts to make 3D Dragon Slayer games in the past. It's been a long time since someone tried, and they have been awful. <laughs> Just absolutely terrible. Now, Dragon Slayer itself, the actual arcade game, has been kind of revived here in recent memory, and so do I think a Dragon Slayer would work in 2022? I kind of do, but you would have to make it like the original arcade games. You have to bring the same artists in. It would need the same art style. In all honesty, Use the same gameplay too. It's like an adventure game where you're in control of a cartoon. And I do realize there are games now that run in real time that look pretty much as good as the animation that was in Dragon's Lair. But when you try to convert that concept into 3D, it just kind of loses its charm. So at the end of it all, after going through all these games, ultimately out of like 12 that I listed, just a few are really worth reviving. A lot of it is just rose-tinted glasses for nostalgia, myself included with Dragon's Lair. I'm guilty of it too. But really, a lot of these franchises, when you look at them, they died for a reason. Thanks for listening to Good Morning Gaming. I appreciate every single one of you who listens to GMG. I'm Shane Satterfield. You can follow me on Twitter at Dinfire and follow Sifted at Sifted Games. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode, but until then, make sure you seize today, because there will never be another.